النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه أمهاتهم بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه أما بعد So I welcome you to our halaqa today um, This is going to be the first of our halaqa for this year 2019 uh, as you all realize, it will also be the last series I'll be doing. Uh, three, four months are left, inshallah, and then Ramadan will come. And then we will basically be concluding over here. So um, I will be doing, inshallah ta'ala, the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the last series on Wednesday, uh, the Ummahat al-Mu'minin. And as a precursor to that series, today we're going to be talking about the Ahl al-Bayt and who exactly are they and their blessings and their distinction and their ranks and a little bit, just a little bit of the differences between, sorry, my glasses are all wet, uh, between us and other groups when it comes to the Ahl al-Bayt and how do we view uh, our rank with Ahl al-Bayt versus the other group's rank of Ahl al-Bayt. So firstly, what is Ahl al-Bayt? Of course, Ahl al-Bayt composed of two words, Ahl and Bayt. And Ahl is the Arabic word for family, but it means more than just family. Ahl comes from the root, even the word ala ya'ulu also has al al bayt and ahl al bayt. Sometimes we say al al bayt, alif with a mad on it and lam, and sometimes we say ahl al bayt, alif uh, hamza ha lam. And ahl and al are really synonymous. Some scholars make a very slight distinction between the two, but really for practical purposes they are the uh, same. And the al and ahl are those whom a person goes back to. So in Arabic we say ala to return. So al is the group that a person returns to all the time. And who do you go back to all the time? Your family. So that's why family is called al because the person returns to the family. So al and ahl are those whom you return to all the time. So you call your family, your supporters even are called ahl. Uh, and Bayt is, of course, house. So, Al al Bayt or Ahl al Bayt are the household of the Prophet. The household, the family of the Prophet. And the definition of the Ahl al Bayt of the Prophet is actually a lot of controversy, believe it or not, within Sunni Islam. Within Shia Islam, it's actually not that much of a controversy, it's more defined. Within Sunni Islam, there are a number of opinions, but frankly, these opinions are technical for our perspectives. It doesn't ma matter that much. Why? Well, a little bit of a precursor here. If you remember the, the genealogy of the Prophet, Muhammad ibn, help me out, guys, Abdullah ibn, Abdul Muttalib ibn, Hashim ibn, Stop, everybody stop here, come on. Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib ibn Hashim ibn Abd Manaf. Okay, so we have to go to Abd Manaf now. Because we, when we define Al al Bayt, the controversy is at the advanced genealogy. Everybody agrees that Ali and Fatima are Al al Bayt. That's what I'm saying. Everybody agrees that Hassan and Hussein are Al al Bayt. The ikhtilaf comes the second cousins of the process, for example. This is where the ikhtilaf comes. So, just to be very quick here. So, Pretty much everybody says the Banu Hashim are Al al Bayt. This is pretty much well known in Sunni Islam. The Banu Hashim. So the Banu Hashim, this is the great grandfather of the Prophet. And Hashim had two sons, Abdul Muttalib and his brother Asad. And Asad had a few sons, but none of them really had sons after. So essentially, when you say Banu Hashim, you really mean Abdul Muttalib. Because Hashim's other children didn't really proceed onwards. Is that clear? So Banu Hashim is synonymous realistically with Banu Abdul Muttalib because Abdul Muttalib's brother didn't really have any grandchildren. He had sons, but they didn't have sons. So basically it's gone. So Abdul Muttalib, we all know, the grandfather of the Prophet And so his descendants that were Muslims, that's two of his sons were Muslims, and many of his grandsons and their children were Muslim. Right? So this is a majority position that, okay, the Banu Hashim are the Al al-Bayt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, along with, of course, his wives. We're going to come to this technicality. Sunni Islam agrees that the wives are Al al-Bayt. 
non-Sunni Islam excludes them. This is the key difference between one of the key differences between Sunni and non-Sunni. Sunni Islam says the Banu Hashim and the wives are Ahl al-Bayt or Al al-Bayt. Now, this is the majority position, the Hanbalis and others, they say this. Some of the madhabs, they say that not just Hashim and Banu Hashim, but Hashim's brother, Al-Muttalib, and the children of Al-Muttalib, which basically mean the second cousins of the Prophet ﷺ that were Muslim. So, the technical difference, the fact of the matter is, I am not aware of any descendants who claim lineage from Muttalib and claim to be Al al Bayt. This is a technical theoretical ikhtilaf. Are there for sure in parts of the world there must be people who will trace their lineage back to Al Muttalib? Okay? Uh, but who are they? Who knows? Nobody tracks their genealogy to that level. The only people who care that much to track their genealogy are, are whom? The? Who tracks their genealogy from Islam that much? The Al al Bayt themselves, the descendants of the Prophet themselves, right? This is the only group that really cares about their genealogy and they're tracking down and they have still shajaras back to the Al al Bayt themselves. So the children of Hassan and Hussein. Okay, these are the only people in our times, it's been 14 and a half centuries. It's now, you know, 1440 plus Hijra now, 1440 years from the Hijra. Who's going to track their genealogy that back? The other cousins, second cousins, third cousins, slowly but surely just trickle down and it's gone. Nobody knows who they are. But they must be there, but it's a theoretical difference. So the, the ikhtilaf really is whether it's only Banu Hashim or it's also... Banu Hashim and Banu Al-Muttalib. Muttalib is Hashim's brother. Now again, remember Abdul Muttalib. Why was he called Abdul Muttalib? Who can remind me the story? goes back to the second class of Seerah, guys. Come on. Now that I'm leaving, you should know the Seerah inside out, right? The second halaqa I gave on the Seerah so many years ago. Why is Abdul Muttalib called Abdul Muttalib? Come on, it's a famous story. His uncle, what was his uncle's name? Al-Muttalib. Al-Muttalib. His uncle, his chacha. Al-Muttalib kidnapped his nephew from Medina, from Yathrib. Remember? Al-Muttalib kidnapped because the mother didn't want to give him away. Al-Muttalib went to Yathrib, found his nephew, brought him back. When they brought him back, the people said, Oh, this must be a slave you got, Abdul Muttalib. So Abdul Muttalib's chacha, his nephew, his uncle, is Muttalib. The Shafi'i position is Banu Muttalib and Banu Hashim are the Al Bayt. Is that clear? Simple as that. And the Hanafi say the Banu Hashim. So it's a technical issue. It doesn't really matter that much to us. Very, very abstract. It doesn't really have any tangible uh, benefit in our times. But the key point, we, Sunni Islam, agrees that the wives are also Al al -bayt. Now, we say the Al of a family is two. You have... Uh, the al bit tabiyya and the al bil asala. The al that is linked and the al that is by blood. The al that is linked is marriage, and the al by blood is descendants. And this is something that the Quran is very explicit about. So, for example, when the angels visited Ibrahim, the angels visited Ibrahim. The Quran says, "Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alaykum ahl al bayt." This is Ahl al-Bayt and the, re and the reference is Sarah and Ibrahim. So Sarah and Ibrahim, Allah calls them Ahl al-Bayt. The wife is Ahl. That's what I'm trying to get, get here. By text of the Quran, the wife is a part of the Ahl. The angels are speaking and they're speaking to whom? Ibrahim and Sarah. They're telling them, you're going to have, you're gonna have uh, Ishaq. After Ishaq, you're going to have Ya'qub. You know? And Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh alaykum. Ahl al -bayt. Very clear. Ahl al -bayt. Also, Musa and his wife. فَلَمَّ سَارَ بِأَهْلِهِ آنَسَ مِنْ جَانِبِ الطُّورِ نَارَ He was traveling with his Ahl and they saw a fire in the distance. Who is the Ahl here? The wife. What am I trying to get at? The wives by the text of the Quran come under Ahl. Why is this so important for us? Because the other group excludes them. 
right? The other group excludes them. So for us, the Ahl of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they include his blood relatives, of course they do, but they must include his spouses as well. And this is something that is explicit in the Quran and in the Sunnah as we're going to come to. Now, the Ahl al-Bayt or the Ahl al-Bayt, they are the relatives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his wives upon whom charity is haram. This is the technical definition. They are the relatives and wives upon whom sadaqah and zakat is haram. It is not allowed for them to take sadaqah and uh, zakat. And this is something that is well known. And the reason why the uncles and nephews of the prophets, not the nephews, the cousins and the children are included is because of an explicit hadith in Sahih Muslim where uh, Al-Hadith, uh, sorry, al uh, uh, Abdul Muttalib ibn Rabi'ah ibn Al-Hadith ibn Abdul Muttalib. So this is the grand, the great-grandson of Abdul Muttalib. The great-grandson of Abdul Muttalib. So in other words, the Prophet Sallallahu um, cousin's uh, grandson. Uh, he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi along with Al-Fadl ibn Abbas. And they were poor. And they said, O Messenger of Allah, can you give us sadaqah so we can get married? We want to get married, we want sadaqah from the Baytul Mal. So the Prophet Sallallahu distant relative, but of the descendants of Abdul Muttalib comes. And his cousin, first cousin, Fadl, also comes. And the both of them were poor. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, can you give us sadaqah? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do you not know that sadaqah is not allowed for the Al of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is for the sadaqah is considered to be impure for us. So who is us here? Abdul Muttalib's descendants. Not just his immediate Fatima and Hassan and Hussein. Abdul Muttalib, so the Banu Hashim, basically, because we said Hashim is only really Abdul Muttalib. So he ascribed his second cousin to his al and this is the banu hashim and therefore it is very clear and that's the mainstream position that all of the descendants of the banu hashim they are from the al of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and therefore this includes al abbas and the descendants of abbas and this includes uh, the al talib abu talib's children so aqil and ja'far and Ali, and all of their descendants are Al al-Bayt. Believe it or not, it also includes Abu Lahab's descendants, not Abu Lahab, because you have to be Muslim, but Abu Lahab's descendants. Did Abu Lahab's descendants embrace Islam? Who embraced Islam? Did Abu Lahab's descendants embrace Islam? His son. Do you remember his name? You are correct, his son embraced Islam. His son embraced Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Uh, and uh, his name was Utbah. And Utbah ibn Abi Lahab, therefore, is a Sahabi. And his descendants lived on. Ibn Hazm, writing in the 5th century from Maghrib, from the Andalus, sorry. Ibn Hazm says he still has progeny in Mecca, Utbah. He still has progeny in Mecca. So 500 years later or 400 years later, they still knew the descendants of Abu Lahab. But over the centuries, his memory faded away because who's going to take pride when your ancestor is Abu Lahab? Who's going to take pride in this? So who, who goes back to Abu Lahab now and says, oh, my ancestor is Abu Lahab, who's going to say that? But technically, Abu Lahab's descendants are also the Al al-Bayt. So all of the, basically, Banu Hashim, they're Muslim amongst them, they are considered to be Ahl al-Bayt. But for us, that's not the controversy. The controversy is the wives, and for us, it is no question that the wives are within Ahl al-Bayt, not only because the Quran uses the term Ahl for wife, but, and this is the key point that you cannot run away from, the Quran uses Ahl al-Bayt for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ explicitly. It's not just for Musa and his wife and Ibrahim and his wife. The term Ahl al-Bayt is used for the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 33. For us, this is the most explicit verse that you cannot deny. And that is Allah saying to the wives, Ya Nisa and Nabi, Ya Nisa and Nabi, all of it is about, O wives of the Prophet, O wives of the Prophet. Then Allah says, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ 
and stay in your houses. وَلَا تَبَرَّجْنَ تَبَرُّجَ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ الْأُولَى And do not display your beauty like the women of Jahiliyyah would display. وَأَقِمْنَ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتِينَ الزَّكَاةَ You know, establish the prayer, give the zakah, obey Allah and His Messenger. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Allah wants to purify evil from you, O Ahlal al-Bayt. And Allah wants to give you tathira, a pure tahir, basically, cleansing. Who is the Ahlal al-Bayt here? The whole verse is about the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 33, is explicit. It's a Quranic evidence that Ahlal al-Bayt includes our mothers. This is something that we cannot run away from. There's no interpretation, really, from this. Of course, the other group, of course, they, they have their way. But just a very basic reading of the Quran tells us that Ahl al-Bayt is something that comes under, uh, the, the wives come under them. Now, what is the main evidence that the other group uses to exclude the wives? It is a hadith found in our sources. It's the famous hadith called the Hadith al-Kisa, the hadith of the covering. It's a famous hadith, Hadith al-Kisa, and it is authentic. And the Hadith al-Kisa says that one day the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in his house and it was cold. He had a blanket on him that was made out of black wool. And Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu came and the Prophet ﷺ told him, come inside the blanket. Then after a while, Hussein came, put him under the blanket as well. Then after a while, Fatima came, put him under the blanket as well. Then Ali came. So we have Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. And along with the Prophet ﷺ, with the other group, these are the famous five. The, the, thing, the five fingers that they have here, you know, the famous five that they have. This is Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein. Uh, you know, uh, these are the, the ones that they consider to be the, the main five. So... This, and then he covered them up with the black uh, shawl and he then recited this verse of Surah Al-Ahzab. إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجِسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Allah wants to purify you, O Ahl al-Bayt, and cleanse you a clean cleansing. So he recited this verse and who is in the, the, the shawl? His daughter, his son-in-law and his cousin, and his grandchildren, two grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein. The other group says, this incident, which is in your books, which is it is in our books, clarifies that the Quran implies the Al al bayt is Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, Ali, and the Prophet These five and their descendants. Is that clear? So who do they define Al al bayt these five and their descendants. They're not interested in Muttalib. They're not interested in the second cousins. They want it from this and only this. And they quote this verse, or sorry, this hadith primarily. The response is very easy. It is allowed in Arabic all the time to use verses to extrapolate to other meanings as well. Is Ali radiallahu anhu from the Al al Bayt? Yes. Is Fatima from the Al Bayt? Yes. Hassan, yes. Hussein, yes. Okay. So we agree. Where is there any controversy? He is reciting the verse and he's saying, Allah wants to purify you. We agree. Nowhere does it exclude the wives. See, that's where the difference comes. The context of the Quran is wives. But the family is included in the term Ahl al Bayt. This hadith emphasizes. Fatima and Hassan and Hussein and Ali are from the Ahl al-Bayt. Do we agree? Yes or no? Yes. There's no controversy. There's no need to read in more than what the hadith tells us. The hadith is telling us that Fatima and Ali radiallahu anhum and their children are from Ahl al-Bayt. No problem. And the Quran is saying that and is also saying the wives are from Ahl al-Bayt. So we do not have any problem with the hadith of the Kisa. And the hadith of the Kisa, the hadith of the cloth, means only that the family of the Prophet includes these people and we have no problem with that. But the Quran and other evidences clearly indicate that the wives are part of the family and not just that, the cousins are part of the Al and every Muslim from the descendants of Banu Hashim is a part of the uh, Al of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is also proven by the fact that the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were not allowed to eat from Sadaqah. 
And this is something explicit. The Prophet told Aisha that, don't you know that sadaqah is not allowed for us? So he is telling his wives, don't take any sadaqah. So sadaqah was haram for the wives, and they are not biological Banu Hashim. Our Prophet did not marry the Banu Hashim, you know, uh, 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 most of his wives were not. So the fact that his wives are not Banu Hashim doesn't mean anything because your wife is a part of the Al by the Quran generically and by the Quran specifically, understand generically and specifically. The term Ahl includes wife. And Ahl al-Bayt specifically for the Prophet includes his wives as well. And therefore there is no question for us that the Ahl al-Bayt are the Banu Hashim and these are the, the blood al bayt And then you have the by relationship al bayt And those are the wives. And the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they have many blessings as well. And we'll go over more of these blessings when I start uh, the series on the wives of the Prophet inshallah, later on. Uh, but very briefly, in the Quran, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala explicitly uh, mentions in the Quran, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ And his wives are their mothers. This is explicit in the Quran, Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 8. وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ His wives are their mothers. So that's why we call them Ummahat al Mu'minin. And what this means is that first and foremost, we have to, uh, obviously they become haram for us in any manner uh, that a woman is, that is haram, she, they are our mothers. They are, there is a mahramiya relationship. It is not allowed for any man to marry after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, any of his wives. This is only for him, not for any other uh, man. Also, from this we learn that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ are his in this world and the next. And we learn this not just from this ayah, but from the hadith of Hafsa radiallahu anha, which is in Abu Dawood. That the Prophet ﷺ, you know, some, some dispute happened and he was thinking of divorcing Hafsa. And Jibreel came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, she is your wife in this world and in the next. She is your wife in this world and the next world. You cannot. This is a permanent relationship now with Hafsa. So they are his wives in this world and in the next world. As well, the fact that we give salat and salam upon them, uh, and uh, that is something that is explicit in the hadith as well, that Allah salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad, and in some versions, wa ala azwaji Muhammad. In some hadith also it mentions. So literally, explicitly, we send salat upon the azwaj, and the azwaj here means whom? Our mothers, ummahat al-mu'mineen. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make dua to Allah that, O oh Allah, give the Ali Muhammad enough food to sustain. Ali Muhammad Qut. Qut is enough food to live. Don't make us hungry. So it's a famous dua. O oh Allah, give the Al Muhammad. So he calls his wives Al. Because, as you know, when he makes this dua, he does not have any sons. Right? And only one daughter is left alive, that is Fatima. So who is the Al? That he is saying, Oh Allah, bless the Al Muhammad, my Al, with enough food so that we are not hungry. Who are the Al? Clearly it is his uh, wives over here. So it is very clear that the wives of the Prophet, as we said, are under the Al and they have a blessed status. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 29, Surah Al-Ahzab, by the way, has many verses about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, and um, at least six or seven can be mentioned, but time is limited here. Allah says that, وَإِن كُنْتُنْ تَتُرِدْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَعْدِ لِلْمُحْسِنَاتِ مِنْ كُنَّ أَجْنَ عَظِيمًا Allah is saying, whoever amongst you wants Allah and His Messenger, then Allah has prepared for you a very high reward. This ayah came down in the famous incident where some of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, some of them were demanding more to live. And the, Allah then said, you have two choices. You either take this world and I'll give you plenty and you will go. Or you choose Allah and His Messenger and remain with me and be happy with this lifestyle. And this is where Allah says in the Quran, whoever chooses Allah and His Messenger, I have prepared for you a very great reward. And every one of our mothers said, we prefer Allah and His Messenger. So by the text of the Quran, because they chose to stay with the Prophet Allah is saying, I have prepared for you a high place. 
And Allah says in the Quran, Ya Nisa an Nabiyyi, Lastunna ka ahadim min an Nisa. O wise of the Prophet, you are not like any other women. So again, this is in the Quran. Explicit Surah Al Ahzab. O wise of the Prophet, you are not like any other women. And Allah says in the Quran, uh, that وَذْكُرْنَ مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَةِ اللَّهُ الْحِكْمَةِ Remember, O wives, all that was recited in your houses of the verses of Allah. So the fact that those wives lived with the Prophet ﷺ, they are being commanded, remember what you learnt in your households and recite them, meaning recite the uh, Qur'an that you heard from the tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. So we therefore affirm that the Al al-Bayt, the wives in Banu Hashim, have a status that is extra special. But what does it mean it is extra special? For us as Sunni Muslims, we believe, and it is explicit in our traditions, that the Al al-Bayt are blessed and noble if they are faithful to Islam. And if they are good Muslims, they will get a blessing for being good Muslims, and they will get an extra blessing for being related to the Al al Bayt or from the Al al Bayt. But if they are not good and it is possible for them to not be good, then their lineage will not help them at all and their blood will not give them a status in the eyes of Allah. In our religion, lineage does not save you, it is your actions. But it is possible that lineage boosts a little bit if your actions are there. It is possible that there's something called sharaf, and sharaf is dignity and honor and respect. And if you have good deeds, then your lineage and honor might help. But if you have no good deeds, then your lineage and honor will be of no help whatsoever. So we do not consider anyone's lineage to be sacred. Anyone's lineage, even if you all think about it, Ibrahim alayhi salam and his descendants, we always like to think about the good amongst them. But not all of them were good. Abu Lahab was a direct descendant of Ibrahim, just like the Prophet was a direct descendant. In terms of direct male lineage, Abu Lahab and Abdullah, his brother, are the same lineage. And Abu Lahab is in Jahannam. And, you know, the rest of them did not embrace Islam other than uh, Hamza and Abbas. So the fact that you have a male lineage going back to a prophet does not make you any extra special or holy. In fact, all of us are the descendants of two prophets, Adam and Nuh. Every human being around you has prophets in our blood. Every human being without exception. Doesn't make us holy. So we have to get rid of this notion that just because your ancestry has a prophet in it makes you special. No, all of our ancestry has two prophets without exception. Every human being, the worst of the worst, Hitler and Stalin have two prophets in their blood. So what? Doesn't make anybody holy. Nuh's son rejected his father's faith. Doesn't mean anything. So we do not consider lineage in and of itself to push you forward into Jannah. And this is something that our Prophet explicitly said. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. مَنْ بَطَّأَ بِهِ عَمَلُهُ لَمْ يُسْرِعْ بِهِ نَسَبُهُ Whoever's deeds hold him back, then his lineage will not push him forward. If your deeds hold you back, your lineage will not push you forward. And what this means is that your lineage will not help you in Jannah in and of itself. It will be your good deeds. But if you have good deeds and you are from a noble line, then the people will love you a double love. Simple as that. And there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, this is how the world operates, Muslim or non-Muslim. This is how the world operates. If, you, if there's a famous personality that everybody loved, his children will be beloved simply because of his father. That's just the reality of the way the world works. Okay? I, I visited uh, South Africa recently, and there was an opportunity to visit uh, you know, Nelson Mandela's grandson. I tried, we, we tried to, it didn't work out. Um, we were, schedules didn't ma match up. But it was an honor if I was able to meet him. Don't you think I would have jumped at the opportunity? One of his grandsons embraced Islam, if you don't know the story, right? So it was talk going on if I can go visit the grandson. Now, do I know their grandson? No. Do I have any friendship? No. Why would I be interested to see the grandson? Because of whom? The grandfather. Not that the grandson himself had done anything. You understand? This is the way the world works. He has a noble lineage. And this is a person with somebody in his ancestry that the world admires. Out of respect. You're like, oh, okay. Let me see if I can see him. 
if we can understand this about a non-Muslim, why is it surprising or anything different if it is from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It's something you actually go out of your way to do. Two weeks ago I was in Mecca and one of the sheikhs I greatly respect and admire is from the Shurafa, from the Sharifs. And he has exactly uh, 36 people between him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I had no fiqhi questions to ask, no theological issues, but wallahi, just out of respect that he is of the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, just out of respect that this is a person, an alim, a sheikh, and I owe him much for the books that I've benefited, and he knows me, I know him, and just to go and visit him. So I visited him and brought an expensive gift just because he is of the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's it. It's just karam. We want to show respect to him. It's not going to do anything. But this is what you do when you love somebody. That his family also comes under that love. So we as Sunni Muslims, we affirm that the Ahl al-Bayt have a love and a respect. But with one condition. And that is, if they themselves are good. If they are not good. If they are impious. If they are unrighteous. Doesn't matter. In that case, they don't deserve anything. So the Quran and Sunnah therefore tell us that the Ahl al-Bayt occupy a status of respect and distinction only if they are pious and that respect and distinction will not earn them a special place in Jannah. Their Jannah is upon their deeds. As the Prophet even said to Fatima, O oh Fatima, you have to do your deeds. I will not help you on Judgment Day. I cannot help you on Judgment Day. Hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And the Quran mentions many blessings and the Sunnah as well mentions many blessings about the uh, Al al-Bayt. And I already mentioned a number of them from the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of them is Surah Al-Ahzab verse 6. As I said, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ The wives of the Prophet are our mothers. And they are our mothers because number one, they are haram for us. Number two, we have to love them with a special love. Number three, we respect them like we respect mothers. Number four, we take lessons from them. When Allah calls them mothers, this means they must be the best mothers. And a good mother, what does she do? Teach her children. So she is a qudwa, a role model for us. So we learn our religion from our mothers. And if you look at the hadith of the Prophet's fiqh and his personal life, our mothers recorded much of his personal life. Our mothers recorded so much about the daily you know, actions of the Prophet wasallam. So we learn from them the etiquettes of uh, Islam. So this verse, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ is one of the explicit verses, not only that, the, 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 the wives are um, uh, part of the Al al-Bayt, but we have to show them extra love. Why? Because Allah calls them mothers. What do mothers do? Or what do mothers, we have to show them? Love. So Al al-Bayt must be beloved to us. We have to love the Al al-Bayt. Also in the Quran, in Surah Shura verse 23, there's an interesting verse here. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Say, O Messenger of Allah, say to them, I am not asking anything from you except love for family. Now, this ayah is very interesting. I'm not asking anything from you. Meaning, I'm not asking money from you, O Quraysh. I'm not asking any stipend from you. But I am asking love for family. Mawadda fil qurba. What does this mean? Two main interpretations. The first interpretation I'm asking you to love my family. Now this interpretation, it is found in some Sunni sources, but it is primarily in the non-Sunni versions of Islam. So they say, this verse, the Prophet is telling the people, you have to love my family. But the mainstream interpretation actually is not like this at all. In fact, it is a very interesting interpretation. The Prophet is speaking to the Quraysh. This is Surah Shura verse 23. The Prophet is saying, I'm not asking you any money, O Quraysh, but I am asking you to treat me like you would a beloved family member. Which means don't kill me. Don't persecute me. Don't kick me out of Mecca. So they flip the meaning around. It's not that the Prophet is saying, I'm asking you to love my family. It's as he's telling them, I am your family. I am one of you. What would you do with one of your own? Would you kick him out? No, I'm just saying, treat me as family, that's all. So 
according to this interpretation, this ayah has nothing to do with Ahl al-Bayt. And in fact, that is the correct interpretation. Why do we know this? Because this verse was revealed in early Mecca. And in early Mecca, was there Hassan? Was there Hussein? Was Ali even married to Fatima? No. When this verse came down, there is no five people under the, the Kisa. Whereas the other group says, this verse is an explicit verse that Allah is sending the Prophet to love Ahl al-Bayt. You, do you guys understand? Or am I losing you? You guys understand what I'm saying? The other group, you know the other group, it says the purpose of Islam is to love Ahl al-Bayt. You know this, that's the main purpose of Islam for them, right? To Ahl al-Bayt becomes the main thing of Islam for them. So they have this verse here. Say, I'm not asking anything except love of family. Mawadda qurba. What is mawadda fil qurba? The other group says, I'm not asking you anything except to love my family. The verse doesn't say my family, it just says family. But the correct interpretation is, I'm only asking you that you love me like you would any of your family. Mawadda fil qurba, I'm your qareeb, I'm your cousin, I'm your second cousin, I'm your part of your tribe. You wouldn't kill, you wouldn't execute, you wouldn't kick, that's all I'm asking. That you treat me like you treat anybody else from your qurba. And this is clearly the correct uh, meaning as well. Nonetheless, the other meaning is for there and you should, um, uh, and you should know that it does uh, exist. The, the a hadith also mentioned the blessings of the Al al Bayt, of them that the Prophet wasallam said, Allah chose Kinana from all the children of Ismail. And Kinana is one of the descendants of Ismail, basically third or fourth descendant, we don't know exactly when. And from Kinana, Allah chose Quraysh. And from Quraysh, Allah chose the Banu Hashim. And from the Banu Hashim, Allah chose me. This is a famous hadith. I did this the first seerah, okay, eight, nine years ago. The famous hadith. Out of all the children of Ismail, Allah chose Kinana. Out of all the children of Kinana, by children we mean descendants, not actually children. Out of all the children of Kinana, Allah chose Quraysh. Out of all Quraysh, Allah chose Banu Hashim. Out of Banu Hashim, Allah chose me. Now, Allah chose Banu Hashim means there is a blessing for Banu Hashim. It means they have a higher rank than other people. Now, again, people get confused. What do you mean they have a higher rank? I thought everybody is equal. We already explained. Everybody is equal in terms of Jannah and good deeds and whatnot. Yes, but there is something called respect and rank of this world. And when it comes to this dunya, people respect others based upon lineage. There's nothing wrong with that. That respect will not cause you to enter Jannah. But there is something called respect on lineage. And this is what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is uh, saying. Also, for us, the famous hadith of the uh, Kisa is an explicit evidence that Allah wants to purify the Al al Bayt and Fatima and Ali and Hassan and Hussein are a part of the Al al Bayt. So this is very explicit here. That the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Allah is saying, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Allah wants to purify you, O Ahl al-Bayt. And in one hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu was with Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, and he said, O oh Allah, these are my Ahl al-Bayt. Allah mahulai Ahl al-Bayti. So, these in particular, there is no question, they occupy a special status. Now realize, when the Prophet passed away towards the end of his life, the only Ahl al-Bayt he has other than his wives are Fatima and Ali and Hassan and Hussein. His daughters, all of them have passed away and none of them have progeny that is living onwards. Okay, So realize this, the other three daughters have passed away. So who is left in his lifetime? His wives and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein and Ali. That's all that is the immediate household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, of the evidences that indicate the Ahl al-Bayt have a high status, is the famous hadith that is called Hadith al Thaqalain. Hadith al Thaqalain. So we have Hadith al Kisa, now we have Hadith al Thaqalain. And this Hadith al Thaqalain, it goes as follows that once the Prophet وسلم, stood up towards the end of his life and he said, O mankind, I am a human like you. And it is possible that the angel of death will come and take me at any time. So I will leave after me two heavy matters, thaqalain. I will leave after me two heavy matters. 
Number one, the book of Allah. In it is the light and in it is guidance, so hold on to it. And number two, my Ahl al-Bayt. I remind you of the rights of Allah regarding Ahl al-Bayt. I remind you of the rights of Allah regarding Ahl al-Bayt. I remind you of the rights of Allah regarding Ahl al-Bayt. So the narrator from Jabir said, who are his Ahl al-Bayt? Aren't his wives Ahl al-Bayt? And Jabir, the narrator, responded, yes, his wives are from the Ahl al-Bayt, but the Ahl al-Bayt are those whom Sadaqa is haram. And that is the Al of Ali, the Al of Aqil, the Al of Ja'far, and the Al of Abbas. All of these are Al al-Bayt. So the narrator of the Hadith, and that is Jabir, uh, he mentions that all of these are from the Al al-Bayt, the wives, and all of them, as we have said. Now, this Hadith is called the Hadith of Al-Thaqalain, and it brings about some confusion in the minds of the masses, especially when the other group uses it. The hadith is very straightforward. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, I'm leaving behind you two very important things. Number one, the book of Allah. Follow it. Hold on to it. Take guidance from it. Number two, my family. Fear Allah with regards to my family. What is their controversial in this? Again, the other group reads in more than what the hadith is saying. He is simply saying, T keep the rights of my family in check and give them their haq and their due. That's something that we all agree with. The hadith does not say that my family will take over political authority. The hadith does not say that my family are ma'soom. The hadith does not say whatever they say, it is as if Allah is inspiring. Nothing. This is our Prophet who loves his family. And he is saying, when I'm gone, you will take care of my family. And we agree, we will take care of his family. It's as simple as that. So the hadith of Thaqalain does not say that you must follow my family. No. The first part of the hadith, follow the Quran. Get guidance from the Quran. Hidayahs from the Quran. The second part of the hadith, fear Allah with regards to the rights of my family. You see, there is no correlation. He's simply saying, get the guidance from the Quran, stick to the Quran, and then you have to give the rights of my family. Excellent. We agree 100% the hadith is as it is. To read in what the other group reads, the hadith doesn't say that at all. So we, again, this is one of those famous hadith, and we have no problems affirming it, but the interpretation differs from us with the other, uh, with the other groups. And uh, of them as well is the famous hadith uh, that is reported in uh, at tabarani and others that the Prophet ﷺ said on the day of judgment every single nasab every single lineage will be cut except for my lineage every lineage will be of no value except for my lineage and what this means our scholars have said as I have already explained that those who are righteous from the descendants of the Al al Bayt they will have some blessings and privilege for being of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, but their righteousness must be there or else their lineage means nothing. And it is mentioned that this hadith was one of the main reasons that Umar an wanted to marry Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Ali an, because he wanted to establish a relationship with the Prophet ﷺ because of this hadith. That I want to have my children who are going to come under this hadith as well. So Umar an was very eager to marry within the Al al Bayt because he wanted to get that nasab that the hadith also um, mentions. And I already mentioned that we, the Salat Ibrahimiyyah in the Muslim Ahmad, it says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi wa ala azwajihi wa ala dhurriyatihi. So it's very explicit. The Salat Ibrahimiyyah in some versions, we give Salat upon the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what this means, therefore, every time a Muslim says in Salah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim what this means we are sending salat upon the wives and the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can you imagine how many hundreds of billions of times that dua is being made in any given moment hundreds of millions of people are saying this 
in any given moment. And they have been saying it for the last 14 centuries. And they will say it until judgment day. And so just the math boggles you. Imagine the blessings of the Al al Bayt. That every Muslim is making dua, raise their ranks, forgive their sins. Salli ala means that, oh Allah, mention them. And when Allah mentions somebody, this raises their ranks. Okay? So Allah's salah is to mention them. And the mere mentioning by Allah means their ranks have been raised up. So just this is enough of an indication of the blessings of the Alil Bayt that every single one amongst them, we are making dua for them to constantly be raised up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, for us, as Sunni Muslims, the Sahaba and the Al al Bayt are not two distinct categories. Rather, the Al al Bayt are within the Sahaba. As you know, the other group make a distinction and they don't like the Sahaba and they consider the Al al Bayt to be basically the only rightly guided people. So I think that it is very important to quickly go over some of the evidences that the Sahaba loved the Al al Bayt. And this is something well known. There was no animosity between Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and between the Al al-Bayt. Rather, there was intermarriages and there was nothing but love and respect. And this is proven by so many narrations. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, he visited Ali radiallahu anhu and Al-Abbas in their houses. And the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. And he said, I swear by Allah, it is more beloved to me to be kind to the family of the Prophet ﷺ than it is to be kind to my own family. It's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. I consider it to be more important to show karam and generosity to the family of Rasulullah ﷺ. To be loving to the family of the Prophet ﷺ is more of an act of worship to me than to be loving to my own family. This is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And he is speaking to Ali and Abbas and the others of the Al al-Bayt. Also, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, uh, also in Sahih Bukhari, uh, he said to the people that, Urqubu Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi ahli baytihi. Guard the rights of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by guarding his family. This is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Guard the rights of the Prophet ﷺ by guarding his family. Also in Sahih Bukhari, although this is Sahih Bukhari hadith, Abu Bakr's uh, you know, love to the family of the Prophet ﷺ, that Abu Bakr finished praying Salat al-Asr and he walked outside the masjid and he saw Hassan, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, playing with the other kids. So he picked up Hassan and put him on his back. He picked up Hassan and put him on his back and he began reciting poetry that may my father be given ransom for you, Hassan. So he is saying, Bi Abi, may my father be given for you. And that is something they would only use for his grandfather. Abu Bakr never said this to any other Sahabi. But now he is saying it for the grandson of the Prophet. And he began to versify in Arabic. You look like the Nabi. You don't look like Ali, okay? And Ali was standing in front of him to kind of, you know, tease, okay? You look like the Nabi, you don't look like Ali. You look like the Nabi, you don't look like Ali. And Ali radiallahu anhu began to laugh at that. It's a joke, like, you know, it's a friendly joke. And this incident is one of the most authentic, it's Sahih Bukhari, one of the most authentic incidents that indicates that Ali and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq were friendly with one another. They're joking and laughing and teasing. That Abu Bakr is picking Hassan and putting him on his shoulder and playing with him in this regard. There was no animosity between the two of them. Ali was in fact appointed in political and relig relig religious leadership by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, by Umar al-Khattab, by Uthman al-Ghani radiallahu anh. All of them used Ali as ministers as I've gone over in my Sira lectures as well. Umar ibn al-Khattab and Uthman and their loves as well for the families of the Prophet is well known. Of them, Sahih Bukhari as well, that Umar radiallahu an in the famous uh, drought in 18th Hijrah. 18 Hijrah, there was a massive drought. People died, flocks died. And the, uh, the, 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 the Sahaba decided to do a famous rain prayer. They hadn't done this for many, many years. So they did a Salat al-Istisqa. 
and the whole people of Medina gathered. And Umar radiallahu anh gave a khutbah. So all of the sahaba that are alive are there. All of their children are there. Umar gives a khutbah. Khutbah that is tisqa. Then when it comes time to make dua, you're supposed to make dua in the salat al istisqa, right? Many of you have never prayed istisqa. Istisqa is a special prayer where you make dua for rain when there is severe drought. When it came time for dua, Umar radiallahu an said that, O oh Allah, we used to make dua to you through your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we will make dua to you through the uncle of your Prophet. Stand up Abbas and make dua for us. So he told Abbas to come forward. And he told him to make dua on behalf of the whole people of Medina. And this is a great honor to Abbas radiallahu an that he is telling him to come and make dua. And this is something that is done publicly in front of all of the people to show the honor to the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is one of the famous incidents again that indicates the status that Umar radiallahu an gave to the Al al-Bayt. As well, of course, we mentioned that Umar radiallahu an also wanted uh, to marry within the Al al-Bayt. And that is why he was persistent a number of times asking Ali radiallahu an to marry Umm Kulthum until finally Ali radiallahu an relented and gave Umm Kulthum to him. And then of course they had children after this as well. It is well known. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, he once said to uh, Abbas radiallahu an, he said to Abbas that Wallahi, your Islam, the day you embraced Islam, was more beloved to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam than the Islam of my father had he been alive. I know this. Umar is saying to Abbas, when did Abbas embrace Islam? Publicly he embraced Islam in the conquest of Mecca. Okay, publicly. We know privately it might have been different, right? So he is praising Abbas and he is saying, your embracing of Islam made the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi much happier than if my father had been alive and had embraced Islam. And this is something again that indicates Umar understanding the fadl of Al al-Bayt. Also, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, when the time came to write down the, uh, the treasury uh, assignment, again, go back to my lecture on Umar, uh, people would get a salary from the government back then. Everybody who's in the city and who's working would get a salary. Everybody. Call it a type of social welfare system, a type. But not everybody in the city, everybody who's basically from early Islam, you get the point. Everybody who has done something in early Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu an gave everybody the same amount, remember that. Okay, he gave everybody the same. He goes, I don't know who's muttaqi, who's not. I'm not judging, Allah will judge in Jannah. In this world, we're all Muslims together. So Abu Bakr gave everybody the same amount. When Umar came to office a year later, he said, how can I give? The one who embraced Islam and fought in early Islam, the same as the one who embraced after the conquest of Mecca. And Allah says, لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل. It's not the same. Those who embraced before and after. So he had a very detailed schemata, a hierarchy of ranks. And the number one rank. Somebody came to him and said, make your family the highest. The Al-Adi. Your the Al. And he goes, no, I will make whomever Allah preferred higher than me. And he began with the Al al-Bayt as the highest rank in money. The number one category in money was the Al al-Bayt. He gave them more than anybody else. Then came the early converts in Mecca, then came the Badriyun, then came, so then all of these tabaqat came, and then he put his own family, the Al-Adi, way at the end, where according to that scheme they arrived, subhanAllah, right? So who was number one? Al al-Bayt. The Al al-Bayt got more than anybody else simply by being Al al-Bayt. So he is giving a status to Al al-Bayt that indicates what he thinks of the sharaf and of the uh, and of the rank of Al al-Bayt. And of course, uh, Uthman radiallahu an is the only human being in the history of mankind who was married to two daughters, you know, of a prophet, as we know. And this is a sharaf for him, and that's why he's called Dhun Nurain. The reason he's given the title Dhun Nurain is a blessing for him, simply for having been uh, married to uh, two of the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
and it is uh, a Dhahabi mentions that whenever Al Abbas walked by in Medina, then even if Abu Bakr or Umar or, or Uthman were on a horse and they saw Abbas, they would stop, get down, and be on the ground when Abbas passed by, so that they are not on a horse when Abbas passes by, out of karam and out of generosity and out of respect to the uncle of the Prophet So this is just an outer respect given to the uncle of the Prophet And all of this shows us again the status that is given to the um, Al al Bayt. And of course, uh, between uh, Ali and our mother Aisha, as we know, it is true to say there were some minor tensions, but these tensions never ever reached the level of impugning the character of the other. That they agreed to disagree, and it was basically at that. And this is proven that they didn't impugn the character by a number of interesting hadith. Of them is the hadith of Shuraih ibn Hani that she, he went to Aisha radiallahu anha, and he said, O oh Aisha, tell me, Basically, I'm paraphrasing, the fiqh of wiping over the socks, mas'al al khufain So she said, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib, because he would see the Prophet ﷺ in Safar, and I wouldn't see him in that time, and he is more knowledgeable than me. Can you imagine? And there is, as you know, things between them. But now a fiqh question is being asked. She has no problem saying, go to Ali ibn Abi Talib, he knows what I do not know. See, they didn't accuse one another of a'udhu billah being bad or evil. Differences happened, we know. Those differences were, unfortunately, you know, manifested in a manner that things happened as we went over them, we went over them. But there was no actual hostility or impugning of character. And that is why even when the battle of the Jamal happened, the battle of the, the camel happened, and Ali radiallahu an basically um, you know, won that particular battle, he made sure that Aisha was treated with dignity and respect, and he sent armed guards back with her to protect her back to Medina. And he gave honor to her, and he spoke to her from behind the curtain and veil, and gave her the honorific titles, and he called her, Ya Umma, my dear mother. Even if what happened happened, the respect that they had for each other's Islam, they knew that they were sincere, and whatever happened, happened. It did not lead to actual um, animosity. And it is well known that uh, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, they used Ali radiallahu an for every single religious and political role, and he as well took advantage of that and did not have a problem cooperating with them. So the claim that there's any animosity between them simply has no basis historically. And Ali radiallahu an had many children, so we get to Abu Bakr and Uthman and we get to Ali, he had 15 sons and 18 daughters. So much of the Al al Bayt goes through him. However, once again, those who preserved their lineage were only from Hassan and Hussein. All of these other 13, he had 15 sons. They're still around, but by and large, over the centuries, people have lost track of who is who. And the main people that are left alive that, that count their lineage are from Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhum. And there is no doubt that these are the main Alul Bayt. However, all the descendants of Ali are Al al-Bayt, even from other than Fatima radiallahu anha. Of course, Hassan and Hussein are the only ones from Fatima, and no doubt their sharaf is the highest because they are the descendants of Fatima as well. But the descendants of Ali technically are also all Al al-Bayt. As for Hassan and Hussein, their status is of course the highest in terms of uh, the Al al Bayt of the children of the Prophet ﷺ because they are considered to be as if they are grandsons, even though they are grandsons from their mother. Still, when it comes to the family of the Prophet ﷺ, it is as if they are grandsons, even through the father, and they're given a very high level of respect. And there are many a hadith about their blessings. Of them, is that uh, the Prophet ﷺ said that Hassan and Hussein are the Sayyid of all of the young men of Jannah. Sayyida Shababi Ahlil Jannah. Hassan and Hussein are the leaders of all of the young men of Jannah. So this is a praise for Hassan and Hussein. And of them is that one day he was playing with Hassan and Hussein and he hugged the both of them and he said, Innahuma Rayhana Tayya min dunya. These two boys are my flowers from this world. So he called them Rehanatayya, my two flowers from this world. 
and of them that he was giving the khutbah and Hassan and Hussein walked into the masjid and they were stumbling through the people, the famous incident, and they couldn't make their way through because it was a dense crowd. <clears throat> so he interrupted the khutbah and he went down into the audience and he brought the both of them onto the mimbar. And he then recited the verse, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَادُكُمْ fitna." That your children are a test for you. And he said, I saw my children, my sons. I saw my sons falling here and there. And I couldn't stand to see them, you know, tripping. So I interrupted the khutbah and brought them on. So he's holding Hassan and Hussein, giving the khutbah. And this is an honor for the both of them. And of course, the famous hadith as well, that once in another version, another hadith, he gave the khutbah with only Hassan. And he held Hassan in the khutbah and he kissed him in front of all of the audience and he said, In hada Sayyid. This hadith is in Bukhari. This son of mine. So he called Hassan a son. This son of mine is a Sayyid. And the meaning of Sayyid is a respected leader. Right? The meaning of Sayyid, a respected leader, a leader who is obeyed. This son of mine is a leader. And a time will come when he shall reconcile between two warring parties of the believers. So this time came in the time of Muawiyah when there was going to be a third civil war and Hassan said, enough is enough. You take the Khilafah, I'm out. So he reconciled. And this is something that the Prophet ﷺ predicted that he is going to reconcile between two great uh, major parties. And Hassan radiallahu an, from our perspective, even though Hassan and Hussein are both beloved, but Hassan has a special blessing over Hussein. And that is that the Prophet specifically said to him, This son of mine, and he said, is going to be a leader, and he said, He will reconcile. So, from our theology, Hassan and Hussein are both beloved, but Hassan has one rank above. From the other group's theology, as you know, you're all aware, is the exact opposite, right? And in fact, in some versions of that strand, such as Ismailism, for example, they skip over Hassan altogether. Some versions. Hassan is not even an imam. And he skips over. Why? Because he gave the power to Muawiyah, and so they kind of say this, this takes him away. So that gives him weakness in their eyes and strength in our eyes. Because he preferred, preferred to avoid bloodshed and gave up power, even though, and this is the irony, we believe he was the more righteous of the two, without a question. We believe he was the better of the two. But to give up any bloodshed, he gave up his political power, and because of this, he is given honor and respect. And Hassan radiallahu an, according to every history textbook, was sent by Ali to protect Uthman in the time of the massacre. And this to us is one of the clearest indications there was no animosity. When Uthman is surrounded by the mob, Ali tells his sons to go and protect. And Hassan, for reasons we went over when we went over, Hussein was a bit sick and whatnot, Hassan became a personal bodyguard of Uthman عن, during the siege. And on the morning of his death, Hassan remained in the house and Uthman knew he was going to die because of the dream. Remember I told went over the story and Uthman insisted to Hassan, I'm fine, nothing's going to happen, leave. And he said, it's Jum'ah, you have to go get ready. He insisted and made a way out because he did not want Hassan to be in the house because he knew he was going to die. And Hassan insisted to be in the house but finally when he kept on persisting, 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 Hassan left and then the mobs attacked. What does this show? Hassan and Uthman have any issue? Of course not. So again, from our perspective, it is very, very uh, clear that Hassan and Hussein are definitely of the uh, 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 righteous people and they have a very high ranking in the eyes of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course in the eyes of uh, the believers as well. Now, one thing as well, before we, we uh, finish off and, and conclude and start again, inshallah, on Wednesday, one thing as well, that what do the other groups say about the uh, blessings of the Al Bayt? The first thing you need to realize is that the other group, the non-Sunni group, we can honestly say that 
one of the main points of Islam for them is the concept of believing in the Al al Bayt. It becomes one of the primary pillars of Islam is to believe in the Ahl al-Bayt. What does it mean to believe in the Ahl al-Bayt? It means that they believe the Ahl al-Bayt have political and religious authority over us. They have a rank that is assigned by Allah, they have a holiness, and they have something called infallibility. They can never make a mistake. So, whatever they say, it is as if it is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they read in many verses in the Qur'an to imply Al al-Bayt. For example, Allah says in the Qur'an, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون No one touches it except the pure. They say the Al al-Bayt are the pure. The mutahharun are the Al al-Bayt. And this for us is the angels in the heaven, right? For example, the whole ayat of Nur. That Allah Nuru Samawati Rad, Mathanulika Mishkat and Fiyam Mishkat is Ali and Misbah is Fatima and this and each one they go over like this. So if you look at the other group, you will find two or three dozen verses in the Quran, they are linked with the Al Bayt. As well, you will find many, many a hadith that we have never heard, never come across, and they link it to the Al Bayt. And um, those are things that from our perspective, uh, it is simply beyond the scope of, of, of reason and, and rationality. And for us, we do not believe that the Al Bayt in and of themselves are holy. They only will be given respect if they have Iman and Taqwa. Otherwise, in and of themselves, they are not uh, going to enter Jannah simply because they are Al al Bayt. From the perspective of the other group, they are literally holy, i.e., they are exuding barakah, and their presence is barakah, and they have powers that Allah has blessed them with that are above the powers of human beings, and the creation bows down to them. So they give this exaggerated respect that, from our perspective, not only is it heretical, but at times it borders on even the concept of Tawheed, and we therefore disagree with their understanding of the um, Al al Bayt, and their evidences are beyond the scope of this, um, you know, this class. Uh, the, <clears throat> the final point, my voice is kind of breaking away, I apologize. Uh, the final point that we have, and that is that how do we know if somebody is from the Al al Bayt or not? And the response is there is no way to know this other than. Uh, the histories that has been preserved by the local um, families that have preserved them. In other words, there is no authentic way to verify who is Al al Bayt other than there are only a few families that are remaining whose lineage is documented by themselves and by the people around them for many, many centuries. So, for example, the most famous of them is the Sharif family of Mecca. Uh, who were rulers of Mecca for over a thousand years. They were the mayors and the governors of Mecca for over a thousand years. Since the time of the uh, Abbasids, they were the governors of Mecca. Until World War I, it was the Sharif clan that was the, 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 the rulers of Mecca. And the Sharif clan are descendants basically of uh, Hassan radiallahu an and uh, the current king of Jordan is from that clan and the teacher that I visited in Mecca as well he is from that clan this is the Sharif clan they have documented their lineage and it is known by themselves and by others so this is a part of that clan you know it and it's documented generation after generation as well there are various families that have kept their lineage alive and well and they have recorded it and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and others they mention anybody who claims to be from the Al al Bayt the proof is on them if they cannot bring a proof, they are not considered to be from Al al-Bayt. Otherwise, everybody would claim it. So, simply to have a legend or to have a folk tale doesn't make you from Al al-Bayt. There must be proof. Once the proof is established, this doesn't mean anything except that you cannot accept Sadaqah and Zakah. That's the only thing that it means. Otherwise, we might give you some more respect in this world, but in the hereafter, it doesn't earn you any extra rank of Jannah those amongst them who are righteous and Sahaba we give them extra respect those amongst them who died as non-Muslims like Abu Lahab they don't deserve any respect at all 
So it is all linked to Islam and those within Islam. We love them just because of their relationship to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Otherwise, they do not have special powers. They do not have miraculous rights. They do not have infallibility. There is no basis for this whatsoever in our religion. And honestly, all you need to do is to look at various politicians that come from the Sharif clan. Let's just leave it at that. And you realize just because your blood is from that descendant doesn't mean you are holy at all. You can betray the ummah. You can sell your soul to Zionists and you can do other things. And you can be from the lineage of the process and doesn't mean anything. That's enough of an indication that it, it, you don't get holiness. The other group claims you become holy. Well, look, it doesn't mean anything. Your actions is what will bring you izzah and honor. And if you are from the Al al Bayt, then those actions will be added to your beauty. And if you are not from, if you're not from the righteous and holy, then your lineage to the Prophet wasallam will be of no benefit to you. So, in a nutshell, and with this we conclude, the Ahl al Bayt are the wives of the Prophet wasallam after they married, before they were married, they were not Ahl al-Bayt. But once they are married, they are permanent Ahl al-Bayt. Now obviously, the families of the wives do not become Ahl al-Bayt. Their brothers, their, they do not become Ahl al-Bayt, only the wives. And then in our times, the ones that are still living, they are whoever is the descendants of the Al-Hashim. And if you want to say the Al-Muttalib as well, it doesn't, it's a theoretical issue. Realistically, the only people that still no, they are descendants of Al al-Bayt, are uh, the remnants of some of the Hassani and Husseini families. And perhaps, perhaps there are some families in Iraq that still have descent from the Al-Abbas because of the Abbasids, and they are Al al-Bayt. If they can prove that they are from the Al-Abbas, then they are Al al-Bayt. And a few pockets here and there, it is said that some of the... Um, uh, uh, others as well have descent, but Allah knows best. In reality, only a few families remain who document their lineage. And for these families, we say, well, good for you if that is the case. And it's a blessing and a sharaf if you are pious and we will respect you if you are. Otherwise, it will not help you in this world or in the next world what your blood or lineage is. We love the Al al Bayt with the love of the Prophet wasallam, if they are worthy of that love. We respect them if they're worthy of that respect, but we do not give them supernatural powers. We do not give them religious hierarchy. We do not say their opinions in religion are any more or less than the opinions of anybody else. They are regular human beings, but their attachment to the family of the Prophet brings them the level of respect that is deserved, and the closer they are to the Prophet uh, in time also, the closer they become. So obviously, I mean, an another point here, you know, you cannot compare Ali radiallahu an with a descendant 35 generations down. Obviously, Ali is much closer. So the farther you go, then obviously the lesser that it becomes. Uh, but we affirm that they are indeed uh, the most blessed family and what an honor to belong to that family and with that inshallah ta'ala we open the floor for Q&A and then inshallah inshallah from this week we'll be starting the Al al Bayt series which is the wives of the Prophet وسلم, the Ummahat series inshallah ta'ala so from this Wednesday inshallah ta'ala we'll be doing uh, the mothers of the believers and uh, hopefully inshallah we'll finish within the next three months and that will be uh, the final series, inshallah ta'ala, for us. Bismillah, yes. So, uh, this is an interesting question that Ibn Hajar, the question is as follows, that once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered his house and Aisha was cooking some food and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what is in that? Uh, can I get some of the food? And she said, oh, this is sadaqa. I cannot give it to you. So he is saying, why was she cooking it? So the response is that in the house of the Prophet Sallallahu there were multiple people living, including the Mawadi were living there, other people were living there as well. So it's not just him, but she did not eat, and she thought that he could not eat as well. Then he asked, but what is the source? So he said, oh, Barira's sadaqah was there, and she gifted it to us. 
So then the Prophet said, it was sadaqa to barira. But when she gifted it, then it becomes a hadiyya to us. So now we can eat from it. So we have to understand that, you know, people are coming in and out of the house of the Prophet and Aisha, like any hostess, she is cooking for the people that might be coming in. So she was cooking something for the people coming in and out, but not for herself and for the Prophet So she said, this is not for us here. But then he said, no, actually it's not sadaqa and it is allowed for us. But it's a good question, the chap. Yes, go ahead. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's winning. He's winning everything. You know, he's conquering the city of Makkah. And at the same time, he's being loved by his friends, by his family. Uh, now, obviously, there's a divine hand in there. But he's winning, and at the same time, he's being loved. You know, like an average man, uh, when you look at an average man, like the most of the successful men would tell you, you know, if you're not hated, you're not successful. So, what, what are the human behaviors or characteristics that we learn from his theory that you, know, you can be successful at the same time you're loved by your friends and family so much that even your friends want to you know, marry you within your family? So what are some of the human characteristics? So I don't agree. So the, I, the, the, you're saying that somebody has said that if you're not hated, you're not successful, but that's not our rule, not at all. On the contrary, so you're always going to have some enemies, and our process had enemies. But for us, the sign of a truly great man is that righteous people love him. And this is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. When you, one of the signs of being a good person is that you are beloved. Inna Those who are righteous and do good, Allah will write for them love. And the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, when Allah loves somebody, He says to Jibreel, I love him. And the angels love him. And the people of this world love him. So the enemies that you will have are going to be enemies that are not worthy to have as friends. Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab type of people. You don't want them on your side. They are filth and scum anyway. Let them be who they are. And honestly, if you look at the world today, look at the Islamophobes. They are nasty people. They really are. Their akhlaq and their demeanor and their irrational hatred. They're not noble. They are your enemies. It's a sign that we are correct, honestly. You know? They're not noble people, these people. So our Prophet them, those who opposed him, and, and I gave you know the seerah, you, you know, if you listen to the, the series, I was very clear that generally speaking, the noble enemies end up converting. Abu Sufyan is the classic example. Suhail ibn Amr is the classic example. These are people, they didn't stoop to a nasty level. And eventually Allah guided them to Islam. But those that were downright mean and nasty, till they died, you know, Abu Jahl is the Fir'aun of our ummah. You know, he is the worst. His akhlaq is the worst. His demeanor is the worst. And he remained that way to the end. So it's not a sign of success to not be despised. No, it's a sign of success that the ones who despise you, they're not worthy of your friend. You know, they're, they're of a certain character. And I think we see that in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah knows best. Yes, sister in the back, or, or you have it? Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, Sallallahu Yes, so, so the question is so the question is that in India and Pakistan there's the concept of Sayyid. Uh, in Arab lands there's also Sharif and others. Um, so I have mentioned this many times and I just quoted Ibn Taymiyyah as well. Anybody who claims to be Al Bayt, which is Sayyid, the proof is on them. Merely claiming doesn't make you a Sayyid. And it is an undeniable fact that in our culture there is a preponderance of Sayyids, right? It is an undeniable fact that the percentage of Sayyids in India and Pakistan is higher than the percentage in Mecca and Medina. You know, so I always I joke like this, and I don't mean to be nasty, inshallah, I'm from that region, so I'm not, I'm putting my own people down myself. So I'm just saying that it's as if all the descendants of the process have migrated to Pakistan. It doesn't work that way, you know? 
every second family claims to be Sayyid. It doesn't work that way. Um, Allah knows best, but it appears that when the Hindus of the Indian subcontinent converted, they adopted for themselves names that made themselves feel a part of the establishment. That is says Abu Bakr Siddiqi. That is says Umar Faruqi. Okay? And some said, you know, just they said, you know, like Sayyid or Sharif or whatnot. And over time, over five, ten generations, their ancestors, their descendants began actually believing, oh, Faruqi, our father is Umar ibn Khattab, you know. The whole Faruqi family migrated to, you know, uh, Lahore, mashallah, tabarakallah, you know what I'm saying. So this type of, of feeling, it, it kind of, sort of, it's something that, by the way, it's not making fun of the Faruqi sins. I know, you, I know we have Faruqi Siddiqs in the audience, <laughs> guaranteed. Half the audience is Faruqi and Siddiqi, and the other half is Sayyid. So amongst yourselves, Qureshis, yes. How many Qureshis we have as well here, right? So, I mean, these are just, you know, everybody's looking at everybody else. Uh, my own grandmother claims she's Qureshi. I mean, you're saying, I don't, don't, I'm not putting anybody down. Wallahi, my own daddy used to say the same thing, you know. So it's nothing, I'm not being any personal here. It's like, you take it with a grain of salt. Okay, if you are so, I mean, Allah knows best, you know. Until you claim the proof, until you bring the proof then these are mere claims. Okay, now, it just so happened, FYI, that I actually discovered my grandmother was actually true in this claim, believe it or not. I used to dismiss my whole life. But it turns out that she was true in this regard. But uh, long story, but my grandmother's side is from Abbas, not from uh, Hassan and Hussein. Abbas side. So, I mean, you discover this the very difficult way after a lot of research. Unfortunately, the one person who saw the shajara as a child in um, uh, in Lucknow, he saw it back in the 30s and 40s, and then by the migration it didn't. But I have a relative who told me that he saw the shajara all the way back to Abbas, and he remembers it clearly that it was a lineage back there. Point is that, okay, so now, okay, so I discovered it. Now what? Doesn't change, you know? Huh? <laughs> oh, I become automatic Qureshi. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, it doesn't matter at all. So what is there to do? So my point is, again, maybe some of it is true. Maybe some of it is true. But it's, my, I am very skeptical personally. And I think it is historically true to say, and it, we learned this from our books of history, that when the Hindus converted, they adopted the names of the people who gave da'wah to them. And they adopted their tribes as well. So there might have been one person from the Quraysh in the army of you know, Muhammad ibn Qasim. And a hundred people said, okay, we'll also take the name. So those descendants, they kept on calling themselves the same, the same, the same, until maybe one of them actually began to believe we are actually descendants of Quraysh. Most of them are not like this. It's simply not true. Okay? Yes, go ahead in the back. Go ahead. So to be a part of Al al-Bayt, the question is, must you be from the male descendants? If so, how do we understand Hassan and Hussein? Hassan and Hussein are an exception, the only exception to the rule. And they are the exception for many reasons. Of them, the Prophet ﷺ explicitly said, this son of mine. And they are given an exception because he had no male lineage, obviously. So Al al-Bayt are all the Banu Hashim, including the sons of Ali from other women. They are Al al-Bayt. But how can you deny that the Al al-Bayt from Hassan and Hussein have a special status in our hearts? I mean, it's common sense. They have a much higher status because their lineage through Fatima is directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the only exception to have a, a special status is Hassan and Hussein. Even though they are Al al Bayt through Ali and Ali ibn Abi Talib and Abu Talib and through Abdul Muttalib, because that's Banu Hashim, right? So Al al Bayt is beyond Ali. It is beyond Abdul, it is the Banu Hashim. But out of the Banu Hashim, how can anybody deny that the one family that is going to be the Krem de la Krem, they're going to be the best of the best, is Hassan and Hussein and their descendants, okay? So the, the daughters of the Banu Hashim will not pass lineage down. The daughters of the Sayyids and the Sharifs will not pass their Sayyid and Sharif down because in Islam, 
it is the father who gives the lineage, not the mother. And this is something that is no difference of opinion over our Prophet ﷺ said, the child is ascribed to the bed it was born on, which means the child is ascribed to the father who was married to the woman that was born. So the shara, the, the, the nasab goes back to the father. So the children of a lady from the Banu Hashim will not be considered to be Banu Hashim. Only the children from the men of a Banu Hashim will be considered the Banu Hashim. And this is something that is well known. Okay, final question before I finish off. Yes, Bismillah. So, a good question. Is there something called hummus? And it, does it go to the Al Bayt? Yes, there is something called hummus. Uh, and it is something that is explicit in the Quran and in the Sunnah and in the books of fiqh. And because sadaqa and zakah is not allowed for the Al Bayt, so they get something called Khumus al khumus, because the khumus itself, what is the khumus? So, if there is a legitimate jihad and there is war uh, booty that is given, then one fifth of it goes to uh, Allah and His Messenger. Now, what is Allah and His Messenger? What does it mean? It means that, according to the books of fiqh, that one fifth will further be divided into five categories. And it will be given to sadaqah and fuqara and masakin and whatnot. And one-fifth of it will go back to the actual al bayt Why? Because they cannot take sadaqah and zakah. So one-fifth of one-fifth of the ghanima. So that's 125. Correct? 125 of the ghanima will be given to the actual al bayt So... If there were ever to arise such a situation and they are somewhere around in the world, then they will get this khumus al khumus of there. Okay? Yes. Very good question. Hafizab asks that, how about the other hadith that I'm leaving behind the Quran and the Sunnah? So, in fact, there are two separate hadith. Two separate hadith. The one of them, the Prophet is saying, I'm leaving behind two heavy things. Thaqalain. The first of them, the book of Allah, follow it, get guidance from it. The second of them, my family, fear Allah with regards to the rights of my family. So this hadith is simply saying, I'm leaving behind two heavy things. The other hadith says, I'm leaving behind you two things. If you hold on to them, you will never go astray. The Quran and the Sunnah. That's a totally separate hadith. And that's something that we base our religion on. Now, the other group comes along and makes a merging. I'm leaving behind two things. If you hold on to them, you will never go astray. The Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. That's not in Sahih Muslim. It's not in any Sahih book of Hadith. And Allahu A'lam, but it is simply not an authentic Hadith. I mean, the isnads of it are very weak. The authentic Hadiths in our books are one of the two. The first one is simply reminding people to fear Allah with regards to his family. And this is something totally valid. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi family is the best family, the holiest family, the, the, the blessed family. And he is leaving this world and he is saying, protect my family. Excellent. We accept this. The second hadith is saying, if you hold on to two things, you will never go astray. The Quran and my Sunnah. And this is Sunni theology. The other group constructs a narrative that is not authentic from these two hadith. And they say, I'm leaving behind two things. If you hold on, you will never go astray. The Quran and my family follow them. No, in our books, there's no such hadith like that. You understand? It's a very good question. I didn't want to go too advanced in this lecture, but it's a very good question. The other group, that is the main hadith that they base their theology on, which is not found in our tradition and an authentic hadith, inshallah. Okay? With that, we will...